So this is joint work with Hugo Basil, Eric Fabre, and Blaise Genest, all three from uh, Rennes. Um, and Hugo was supposed to come and present the talk here, um, but he ditched, which means that I get to present it. So I made him give me his uh, thesis slides. So Hugo is a PhD student who is just graduating. And this is uh, going to be based on his slides. So as promised to Benjamin, so I have about um, uh, 15 minutes of the main whatever to give you an idea of what the problem is, what is interesting, why you should be interested in it and so on. And in the remaining time, I will go into the details. So at that time, you can stop me whenever you want, <laughs> right? Uh, all right. So, um, uh, so the outline of the talk broadly will be uh, this. So I'd like to uh, start with the model, look at some uh, the problem that we are considering, uh, what are our results and what are our approaches and uh, uh, then towards the end I'll try to discuss a little bit about related work as well as to extend this to some settings and what were uh, kind of more uh, applied uh, settings from security. Um, uh, so the uh, basic uh, motivation of our model comes from uh, imperfect information. I mean, uh, you know, the exact uh, state may not be known of an underlying uh, system and uh, this could be because of various reasons. You may want to hide the state, maybe there is a lot of noise, maybe the uh, sensor uh, only looks at one level and so on. And so you have many examples of such states. As, as I told you, uh, these things are all REN specific. So this is an automatic car at a REN, uh, uh, a driverless vehicle which is running around the campus there. And we tried putting our feet in front to see whether it would stop and it did. So, so somewhere it is doing something, right? Uh, you could have a lot of uh, um, uh, examples of imperfect information. And the question is looking at only the observable information coming out of the system. Uh, uh, what can we recover from it? Right? This is a classical kind of problem and uh, we want to look at it in one specific setting um, and indeed uh, the generic kind of statement would be that uh, from a bunch of uh, um, um, if, I, if I have a, if I'm given an observation can I figure out uh, which uh, system produced this? So for instance take a randomly generated sequence yeah, I think all of you know about this uh, uh, sequence and the question is which stochastic system produced it? On the right is a deep neural net which uh, generates statements randomly and on the left is another stochastic process and we don't know which one produced it and our goal is for instance to figure out uh, uh, who could have said this, right? So uh, with that as the motivation, I think we can start with the real talk. So this is going to be the funnest that you'll get, don't worry. So, <laughs> Um, all right. So uh, more formally, uh, uh, the classical model, one classical model that people have been looking at, is on uh, on hidden Markov models, uh, uh, or uh, where you can consider a Markov chain, which is a bunch of states with uh, with probability over the transitions. And uh, the in hidden Markov models, typically there is a, a, a signal which is being emitted at every state. And very often it is assumed that the signal is stochastic. So there is some probability associated with which the signal is emitted and there is a probability associated with which the transitions are taken. And as always from one state to go, to the, the sum of the outgoing probabilities to go to another state adds up to one, uh, classical, right? Um, and, uh, but we will very soon uh, look at a, a kind of a, also a formal model, but uh, of a labeled Markov chain where we abstract away and we consider um, uh, uh, the labels to be on the transitions rather than being on the states. Is that fine? Yeah, so slight modification. And the reason is that uh, in the, uh, uh, let's say, automata theory community, uh, I, a lot of, lot of people have looked at this, whereas the first one comes more from a motivation of the AI ML community. So in some sense, one of the goals of this work as I will say a bit later, is also to bridge the gap in uh, between the way the problems are looked at. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, as written here, this is often looked at automatic control, this is often used in formal methods, and one can easily see that expressively they are about the same. Uh, you can always, like you can basically add one more step and say that, okay, if this is emitted with probability one, I can actually break it and write that probability on the state. So I won't go into the exact translation, but this is not very difficult to see, right? So all we are saying is that I can encode that as like a partial step in between, right? 
So then the question is really uh, that if I tell you that there is a bunch of systems um, A1 to AK, right? And in particular, we will start with two systems because otherwise we can always do a pairwise comparison. Uh, I give you two systems and an observation which has been produced. What is an observation? These labels which have been emitted. Because we made the assumption that these are uh, uh, letters, this is a word over this alphabet. Is that fine? All right. So, uh, so given a bunch of observations, I want you to tell me which of the systems produced it. All right. Is the setting clear? So, what we have is a bunch of, uh, and for my talk, I will keep just two, but uh, I can always extend it. So, I have two uh, uh, um, hidden Markov models, but again, I'm going to look at only uh, labeled Markov chains. And I'm starting here, and one of the two has happened, right? So, what is known to the observer? We know the system. So, we know the structure of the system. What we don't know is which choice was made. Is that fine? That's important, right? Uh, so, for instance, suppose I see the sequence B, 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 A, what would you conclude? Of course, it belongs to A1 because only A1 has A, B1 has no A, right? Uh, and, uh, but indeed, in this example, can you always do that? So, there is a word for which you cannot figure out who produced it, right? If I just generate a bunch of Bs, then I don't know who produced it. Is this fine? All right. So, uh, one can think of different ways of defining the classification problem and we will look at some variants. Again, there is a lot of literature on many different variants and again, depending on which community you belong to, you may have come across these with different names, right? And one or two of them I will introduce here, but uh, uh, more, yeah, please look at the paper for more, uh, more uh, references. Yeah. So, given two uh, labeled Markov chains uh, with language of observations, uh, L1 and L2, uh, one uh, question could be that, okay, for any word, any infinite word that I have, for does there exist a finite prefix, right, for which I can actually say, does it belong to this guy and not that guy? For every word, I want to be able to do this. Is that clear? So, in other words, if I take this, it is not sure because there exists a word for which I cannot figure this out. Yeah? This is sure. I mean, I really want to be certain. No matter what comes, I want to be able to say that I will distinguish it and that is not true for this. Right? But actually look at the probability measure of the words for which we cannot decide. In this case, it's a probability zero set, right? Because it's exactly one set which is bigger and bigger. I mean, you can take the, as an infinite word, it's a single word. Right? So, one can immediately therefore define almost sure classification where you are saying, okay, fine, I want to actually figure out is the probability set as a set, is that set of measure one? Is this fine? Okay. So, these are two questions, but actually we might be interested in something even more. Uh, so, if I take this one, so for instance, suppose I take AB and AB, but on the left hand side, I have one tenth and nine tenth. And on the right hand side, I have 9 tenth uh, probability of doing A and uh, so uh, with 1 tenth probability, I emit a B, right? So, for this one, what do I do, right? Whereas, I would like to be able to, so if I gave you this, if you, what would you do? What would your best guess be? The languages are the same, right? What would you guess? Well, you will try it, right? you will sample it. So, in other words, you will try a long enough run and if you see a lot of A's, you will conclude, ah, it must be from the second guy. And if you see a lot of B's, you will conclude, okay, yeah, it must be from the first guy, right? And with a high probability, you would be true, right? So, that is kind of what we are going to. What we want to capture is this notion of uh, limit, sure, where we can add a confidence with which we can classify these problems. Is this fine? Okay. So, indeed, uh, when I mean, when I say I'll use the term classifier and a classifier is nothing but for any finite word, I will just say whether it belongs to one or zero. Indeed, classifier means that it can make an error, right? I mean, it, it's not perfect. It need not be a sure classifier. So, the question is, uh, uh, when does a classifier exist and when it exists, how do we build it? So, when I say classifier, it could be a classifier which satisfies this definition, second definition or the third definition, right? So, it turns out that this problem actually 
unsurprisingly has received a lot of attention and uh, if you look at the sure classification problem uh, it was uh, solved a long long ago um, where it was shown to be in n log space essentially the idea is you just take a product of a1 and a2 where you take the product with respect to the actions and you check whether there is a loop which comes right uh, similarly this problem of almost sure classification is more recent but it has been again looked at in the language of diagnosis for those of you who know again i won't go into the details but the, uh, there is a easy enough proof which shows that this is p space complete okay so the goal of this paper was to uh, or this work was to look at this in between notion not in between whatever this other notion of limit sure uh, classification and try to come up with algorithms for it and try to come up with characterizations for it right so let's define it formally and uh, while defining it i'm going to slightly change things right so uh, i will say that two uh, labeled markov chains are limit sure classifiable if there exists a classifier remember a classifier is just a function from sigma star to 1 to uh, such that if i see a run of one of the process then and if the observation that is uh, so observe of rho is just the labels emitted by rho right uh, the probability that I make a mistake that is I say that it uh, the classifier says that it belongs to uh, the other guy when it belongs to process 1 right this goes to 0 as the length of this goes to infinity. So what I want to say is that as we have more and more statistics right on the observation we should be able to always give the correct answer at the limit that's what this is saying is that fine okay right so again this is one way to define it so yeah so uh, the probability of misclassification that is of making an error goes to zero as the length of the run goes to infinity okay good uh, more examples this guy exactly satisfies it's been made to in uh, some sense satisfy this property and uh, indeed uh, if the proportion of a is greater than half uh, i mean if, the proportion, if i see more than half times a i will report one and otherwise i'll report two and this is my classifier right but this classifier has a very common name in uh, in uh, at least the ai and uh, uh, control community and sometimes it's called the maximum a priori uh, a posterior classifier which just says that you look at that you look at the probability if the probability of this is greater than that then you re return this and indeed what we are saying is that if there exists a limit sure classifier then this map classifier which is kind of the uh, uh, classical one is a limit sure classifier Again, formal proofs, I'll let you read the paper, but uh, this is not a very difficult thing to prove, but you can see that that's kind of what we are doing. So if you know that indeed this is possible, that there, uh, this classif limit sure classification is possible, then there is a very simple type of classifier which can give you the answer. That's what we are saying, right? Uh, so some observations. So notice that the, uh, uh, yeah, this I think we already saw, um, uh, even though the language a non probabilistic or non stochastic language is the same you are uh, uh, it can still be classified by looking at the statistics uh, and this is as different from uh, sure and almost sure of course uh, but on the other hand if for every observation the probability of observing the observation is the same then of course you cannot classify it right i mean again something very trivial uh, which is that uh, if i'm able to show that two things are equivalent that is for all um, words in sigma star the probability of seeing one word from a given initial state so I forgot to write this, this is from some sigma 0 so from a given initial distribution is equal then uh, this is called these two languages are said to be equivalent and indeed if I know that two languages are probabilistically or stochastically equivalent then I cannot classify them with this limit sure classifier the question is is the converse true and in general it's not right so actually now it so turns out this is again quite classical and uh, it was already known a long time ago that checking equivalence between languages of two LMCs actually one of them is a LMC the other paper is on PFAs checking language equivalence is already in polytime okay so this is again not very difficult but I won't go into this this is not really our result and uh, this is kind of the base case right so we start from here 
and we say okay what else can we do right so uh, i come to the uh, kind of uh, the breakpoint slide so uh, what we give the results in this paper are we give a new characterization for limit sure classification um, and a polynomial time algorithm to check it right um, and indeed while to do this we actually develop a new notion of stationary distributions over labeled markov chains what is classically known are stationary distributions over markov chains we have to lift it to uh, in kind of in a correct way what we believe is the right way to lift it to labeled markov chains and that's what we use as our primitive right um, and uh, in doing so we are also able to compare with other notions of uh, opacity and distinguishability which have been looked at in other communities and there we figured out while doing this that in 2016 uh, uh, this notion of distinguishability was defined by Stephen Kefer and uh, uh, I think Arvind Prasad Sisla and they showed already <laughs> that there is a polynomial time algorithm for this. So it so turns out that uh, our notion of uh, classification for labeled Markov chains coincides with the notion of distinguishability. It's not completely trivial to see that, but you can prove both ways. And as a result, we could have just directly just said, ah, well, it, uh, uh, it's the same as that and therefore. But nevertheless, we wrote this paper and why was that? A, we had already done the work and B, it was also the case that, uh, oh, sorry, it's not written here. So it's also the case that our technique differs quite a lot from the uh, Kiefer uh, Sisla technique. Uh, Kiefer and Sisla look at uh, define a metric between probabilistic systems and they prove that the met when that metric is equal to one, things are indistinguishable, right? Whereas our thing does not go through such metric arguments and we actually use what I would like to say is more a first principles approach, but that's up to you. It depends on what your first principles are, right? Uh, so that's kind of one reason to look at it. There are other reasons also. Uh, in doing so, we were able to also uh, kind of get a slightly uh, more efficient algorithm, arguably in the number of, uh, so of course, both these are p time because you can encode it as a linear program and the number of variables that we required was slightly fewer than uh, the kiefer sisla in the worst case. And um, the other reason was that uh, when, so if you want to think about a security uh, perspective, that is if you want to think about uh, um, uh, 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 security domain, then what would you want to talk about? You may want to say that is this really, I mean is this how a, um, uh, uh, an attacker would try to classify? What would an attacker do? If he finds, he or she finds that after several attempts, he or she is not able to classify, you would rather take a reset, right? You would say, okay, screw it, I'm going to start again, right? So if you do this, this is what we call attack classification, where we uh, extend this model with the ability of the, um, uh, of the strategy to do resets. Indeed, when I do reset, uh, the player can decide to now take not the first model, but the second one. But as long as this is allowed and only finitely many attacks are uh, required in the limit, um, um, then we are able to show that uh, this problem, the way we have defined it, we can still show that this problem can be solved in p-space. So it's in fact p-space complete, whereas this shows a big difference with the notion of indistinguishability from uh, Kiefer et al, where that problem becomes undecidable. Okay, so that's kind of, uh, so since I won't have time, I've already told what is in my last slide, so we don't need to go there, right? All right, so in the remaining, five minutes that I have, I'm going to go into the details, but at this point, if you have any questions, please ask. Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, so how did we start? So, well, we started by actually looking at, uh, we didn't start this way, but this is probably an easy way to start, which is to look at um, um, uh, what happens uh, when you are at a stationary distribution of the underlying Markov chain, right? So, uh, so suppose I look at, um, uh, so maybe I will skip this slide, I'll go directly to the second slide. Yeah, so this, basically if I take two uh, probabilistic systems, labeled Markov chains, and if I know that they are ergodic, and if I know that the probability mass on my, uh, on all the states is strictly positive, then it turns out that, you remember the, the, the trivial direction that we had when we started with? So this is actually uh, by implication. So in other words, 
So I will just explain that with an example. So basically the result is and this it turns out again was known with another definition called opacity but in this restricted case. In the case where things are ergodic and in the case where you assume that initially the probability distribution covers all states that is the support of the probability distribution is the entire space then uh, you can show that uh, they are not classifiable if and only if uh, they are stochastically equivalent. So both ways it's true and uh, kind of uh, the idea is look at this guy right. So these are two different um, uh, LMCs by putting two start states here I just mean that the initial starting probability is greater than 0 I don't mean that there are two states uh, starting states. Uh, and if you notice if I reach the stationary distribution from the stationary distribution the observations that I see are the same they cannot be used to distinguish the, the two sets right. So if I assume that I start from there then stochastic equivalence actually coincides with uh, the limit sure equivalence that we are looking at right. So that was kind of where we started with but you can see that this idea that the initial states should all be having a non-zero probability was crucial because suppose I take these two uh, systems these are exactly the same systems the only difference is that the start state is here and the start state is there right. What is the stationary distribution of this half and half right the stationary distribution is the same on both but uh, so therefore you would conclude that it is not classifiable but actually this is classifiable right. Why? Because the first step tells you here that if I in the first step there is no B possible here there is no A possible. So indeed this is classifiable but so, so in other words this assumption that in the initial step all your uh, states must have some probability mass was crucial right. So this allows us to say okay to extend uh, this result to uh, the general LMC setting we have to actually look at states which are not reachable with just one observation and that is kind of the motivation to define stationary distributions over labeled Markov chains. So how we come up with that is uh, kind of I would say one of the uh, nice contributions of the paper to, and again the definition is very elegant and I would not be surprised if uh, we can find it in some other guys somewhere else but we searched a lot and we did not find it. So let me so I have again a lot more detail but instead of doing that uh, let me just say that once we define such a uh, uh, such a, a notion of a stationary distribution uh, over LMCs what we are able to show is that one cannot limit surely classify between two processes if there is some belief state which is reachable that is a product of states right. So a set of states which can be reached such that from there you see this probabilistic equivalence right and the language so this is written in semi formal language uh, the, uh, the, the observations seen till there and the observations seen from there are both the same. So this is the way to extend. So uh, remember that uh, the earlier theorem had only this it did not have these two and it was not over beliefs. We have to define the notion of beliefs which are sets of states where you can be at and then define this notion of stationary distributions and we are able to show that from that stationary distribution this probabilistic equivalence will hold that is kind of the way we lift it to the general case ok and uh, that brings me to I think yeah so I do not have too much time. Uh, so as I promised there is this link between distinguishability and uh, if you look at uh, Stephen Kiefer's uh, distinguishability result uh, the p time algorithm there uh, was proved in a LIX 2016 paper and it used itself as a subroutine uh, uh, a CSL 2014 paper by Kiefer and Chen. So it is quite a quite a complicated uh, non trivial result to prove that and I believe what we have is something uh, as nice if not nicer. Uh, so that kind of uh, brings me to my uh, uh, ending I will not describe the uh, security context I will just go with the conclusion and just say that okay this is the kind of stuff we have done and I am open to questions. So how hard is it to uh, classifier? If it is limit sure distinguishable it is just the map classifier it is quite easy I mean the map classifier is limit sure if it is distinguishable if it is not then yeah. So a like obvious dumb thought dealing with the like problem of sort of initial things distinguishing might be is that is that maybe it is the case that you are distinguishable if and only if 
these distinct these distributions are the same and you have the same language of possible words. I assume you have a counter example shows that's something like that. That doesn't that's not sufficient. So we have a counter example in the paper. Maybe we'll I, I'll explain it to you offline. Yeah. Yeah, so that's Kulbit's question as well. So <laughs> so uh, I'll be in. Ah. So basically what the classifier is, is basically saying that you look at the frequency of the behavior and depending on what the, so if you are given a word, right, all you need to do is to check whether the number of, uh, uh, I mean if it's more likely to be here or there and then you answer 1 or 0. So again, we did not go beyond that but uh, I mean in practice if you want to construct it, I don't know what it would be. But I guess this is a well studied problem. So I, I mean the reason we did not look at it, we lost interest actually once we showed that it was the map classifier which was the best. Before that we thought we could come up with a different classifier which is better. But then we showed that this is kind of uh, already a limit sure classifier. Then we kind of lost interest in uh, showing anything more. But yeah, I don't. So the classifier is uh, takes uh, as input any finite word and tells you 1 or 0 based on that. But the property indeed is defined in terms of the limit but yeah. But it is a probabilistic thing right. So, yeah so that the property yes because I want to say that yeah. So do you, do you consider how many consider how many uh, words you would make without a classifier? No, that is a good question. So that, uh, that is, uh, uh, so that would be a nice direction to take. So the question is, uh, can, how quickly can I qu classify it? Then maybe map classifier is not the best classifier, maybe, yeah, that I have not thought about. You think? It still be the best classifier, yeah. But there is an interesting question of like the quantitative version, how does the likelihood ratio? Yes. What is the likelihood radio, or how do you uh, estimate? Well, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Thank you.